The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend on the show, we discuss talks from the most recent general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a little bit of fun as we discuss the words of the awesome men and women God has called to direct the church in these latter days. I'm your host, Matthew Watkins, and today I'm joined by an old friend of mine. He and I both grew up in the same ward in North Carolina. This is Eric Wells, who currently lives out in Utah. Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Matthew. It's fun to be with you here on the show. Yeah, my name's Eric. I'm living in in Springville, Utah at the moment, and uh, it's nice to be here talking about uh, General Conference with you. We always like to ask our guests, why don't you share a conference memory or some way that conference has impacted you in the past? You know, talking with you, Matthew, has reminded me a lot about our good old North Carolina days, and and I I, I look back on those days with fondness. Um, some of the some of the best memories that I have of General Conference in North Carolina. I remember one time uh, there was a hailstorm um, in between sessions, and my brothers and I all ran out into the backyard and were jumping on the trampoline in the hail, and we broke the trampoline. My dad was so <laughs> mad. Um, was it you that broke the trampoline or the hail that broke the trampoline? It was most likely me. I was doing some sort of crazy backflip situation there. <laughs> no, but it, it was good. And and one thing that my dad taught me too was that general conference was a time where we think critically and we reflect. He loved to read. And so I guess I've always associated that with general conference, that it's a time to think critically, to ponder the words of, of our modern day prophets and to think about how we can make our lives better. So Kind of a simple memory, but that's always the feeling that I had associated with it was just trying to live a deliberate life. That's awesome. Well, speaking of that, we have two 70s speaking to us today. We've got Elder Peter F. Unpronounceable last name Mears. Mears? I'd be very interested to hear how he pronounces it. Now, he is from Australia, which you know, immediately makes him cool and uh, served in numerous callings, including full-time missionary, elders, quorum president, branch president, bishop, stake president, counselor in a mission presidency in Area 70. And he was sustained as a general authority here in 2016, currently serving in the Asia Area Presidency. He received a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Monash. Monash? Wow, lots of unpronounceable names here. Well, I'll say Monash. University <laughs> in 1980. He worked for ESSO Australia. Now, this is interesting. Usually in these bios, they don't list the company names, but this one does. ESSO Australia and the development of oil and gas production fields. He's a founding partner of Worley Parsons Limited, an international engineering services and product management company led an iron ore project for Fortescue Metals, where he served as an executive director on the board. He was born in Australia in 1956. He married Maxine Evelyn Thatcher in 1979, and they have four children that we are actually going to hear about in this talk. So his talk was titled, He Could Heal Me, with the me being italicized. What did you think of this talk as you read over it? I was impressed with the level of vulnerability here, Matthew. And I think that's the thing that struck me the most is that um, this general authority is speaking from his heart. He's sharing something deeply personal and deeply painful. I mean, can you imagine standing up at the pulpit in front of however many millions of people and and talking about one of the things that you regret most in life? Him being able to stand up and say that and to work through his journey toward finding healing for his own mistake. I was really touched by that. And I think that's a great example to all of us of how not only can we learn from from our experiences, especially the ones that we're we're ashamed of, but how we can do that publicly. And and we can we can learn from all of our experiences and and and, and not hide from them. I, I was really inspired by his example and how he did that. For those who may not remember, he shares about driving back from a family vacation in Australia, crashing head on into the, the car. Now, this is probably because they're driving on the wrong side of the road as the rest of the country was. He crashed headlong into another car and his wife he had a badly fractured leg and a broken sternum. He had some minor injuries, but their five-month-old son, their boy named Jerem, nice little Book of Mormon name there, was unresponsive and 
climbs out of the car to give his baby boy a blessing, has to lay down on the ground to do it. He says, by the time the ambulance arrived 40 minutes later, Jerem was conscious. Now, this is everyone who's listening to us knows I have one rule in general conference talks come. The child cannot die. That is my number one rule. And he followed that rule, but he sure kept us on the edge of our seats until the very end of the paragraph with one word that he let us know that his son did not die. So I, I give him half a point on that. But then he talks about just his experience after that, going through such a traumatic situation. I don't know if it was, would you call it survivor's guilt or causal guilt, just feeling incredible guilt for having been through an, through an innocent mistake. It, it's interesting. He never calls it a sin. He's very careful and deliberate saying this is not an intentional thing. And he could distinguish that intellectually. He could recognize that fact, but that did not help the guilt that he was feeling inside tearing him up. And I, in his situation, I could imagine myself very much in his shoes feeling exactly that. And he talked about being harrowed up and not being able to sleep. It just sounds awful. Yeah, Matthew, I, I can't imagine being in that kind of scenario. And so his his journey and him sharing it publicly is inspiring. There is a friend of mine who, in a similar situation in a way, was involved in and responsible partially for a serious accident of their child. And as I spent time reflecting with and trying to comfort and understand this friend of mine, um, they kept saying that everybody tried to make it better for them, right? They, they kept saying, yeah, I I wish I could believe when people would tell me this isn't your fault and you're not responsible for this. And this individual told me, no, but I know, Eric, I know that I'm responsible here. And as we, as we tried to think about that together, one insight that she made that really struck me was that, um, you know, the point is not for God to erase the fact that I was responsible. If he takes away a mistake that I made, then it's taking away an opportunity for me to learn something important. And the important lesson, she said, that I'm supposed to learn here is that God is bigger than all of my mistakes. We came here to earth and we were allowed to participate in some absolutely horrible things. Why? Well, because in the process of doing that, we learned that it's not really about us being perfect. It's about learning that God is bigger than us. And he's got that covered. He accounts for all of our mistakes and we can learn how to trust him and thereby participate in a, in a reality, in a joy, in a prospect for a future that is so much grander than we could ever anticipate for ourselves or create for ourselves for that matter. And, and I, uh, that was really important for me to hear that, you know, when, when so often we try to, to buy our own salvation and say that we're good enough through our perfect actions. And certainly our actions are important, but at the end of the day, it's Christ. And so, Matthew, you probably have more to say about this too, but that's, that's the feeling that I get from this talk. You know, I remember listening to this general conference this last time, and he goes into depth about the redeeming love of the Savior and, and how that was instrumental. That was the only reason why this, this healing was possible in the first place. Beautiful insight there. The Book of Mormon sheds a little bit more light on this than I think we get out of the Bible. And, and this is certainly not a knock against our Christian brothers and sisters. Their understanding of Christ's grace in, in many ways, sometimes I think uh, certainly is, is more solid than my own at times. But one of the wonderful things we learned from modern revelation of the Book of Mormon is just the scope and extent of the Savior's atonement, right? It, it goes far beyond he hung on the cross to pay for our sins. We read in Alma, we read in Second Nephi, that it's not just the payment of sins that Christ is actually bringing to pass. He suffered our sicknesses. He suffered every misfortune, every tragedy, every trauma we could ever experience. He also paid for our transgressions, the innocent mistakes that we make without even realizing that we're violating God's law, which happens probably more often than we realize. And he covers for our innocent mistakes, like falling asleep at the wheel, our innocent mistakes that may set off a spouse sometimes, or whatever the case may be. He truly has experienced and paid for every single one of those things in a way that is far more, it covers far more than I think we realize. I really like thinking about Jesus as a parent. As I look at my children, they have no idea how the family finances are. They have no idea how much the bed and the bedding and the clothes and everything that they get actually costs. And if they truly had a sense of how much it would cost compared to their you know, quarters that they're saving up, they would be astounded. They wouldn't be able to fathom a number like that. They wouldn't realize how much they have it. 
And when I was a teenager thinking on that, I thought, oh, this is something that parents must just really resent their children for not truly appreciating the gifts that they're given. But now that I'm an adult, I'm a father with kids, I don't resent it at all. I don't expect them to understand it. And I don't feel any need to make them fully understand it. I'm just happy to provide it. And they don't even know that it's being provided. They'll learn it someday. Maybe they'll learn with gratitude or not. It doesn't really matter. As a father, I love to give good gifts to my children. And the Savior does as well with his atonement. I think it's far more operative in our lives than we give him credit for. That's powerful. I like thinking about it that way too. As a parent myself, I I agree with you. The simple act of providing for my children brings me joy. And if at some point in their life, they turn around and are thankful for the things that I've done, that's really what I want, right? I just want to be connected to them. I want them to turn to me. I want to have them in my life. And and it and it's nice to have them be grateful for the sacrifices that that I have made as a parent. So to think about our heavenly Father participating in a same or similar process is very humanizing, and I think that makes him very relatable to me. Yep. So Elder Mears was not able to feel that for a while. It's interesting. I heard of uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta that the last fifty years of her life, you know, this amazing saintly woman that we often think of as being very close to God, she describes her experience. She says, well, actually, the last 50 years, even though I've had strong spiritual impressions the first part of my life, these last 50 years, I haven't felt God close. Almost like the Savior who cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I I feel abandoned and alone very frequently, but I have faith in what I've already learned to keep going, keep moving forward with the light knowledge I've been given. I feel, I get that same sense from Elder Muirs when he is talking about these feelings of guilt. And he says, guilt and remorse for causing such a terrible accident. I would wake during the night and relive the horrific events. I struggled for years to forgive myself and find peace. And at this time, he says, as a priesthood leader, which, I mean, we know he, he went on to serve as elders quorum president, branch president, bishop, stake president, counselor, and a mission presidency. I don't know which one of those callings specifically he was serving in, but in all of those callings, he's trying to help others find peace and come closer to Christ's atonement, and he still hasn't felt the impact and the forgiveness of that in his own life. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I can, I can see the connection there. And one thing that comes to my mind that's relevant here too is that that space where people are questioning and wondering and trying to find God and he seems absent, I feel like mental health um, more often than not comes to, comes to mind. Um, people that are struggling with mental health often feel alone, often feel like they are alienated from God. And it can be very confusing to wonder why, why at this critical moment of my life does it feel like I'm alone? And that's a very sensitive and, and delicate subject to start treading on. And, you know, I'm not really qualified to tell them, you know, how it's all going to make sense in the end. I just think we have to have that sort of faith. And I think, and I think this elder would agree that when the healing does come, uh, the context at that point that he received and and the love that he felt must make it all worth it. And he closes with this wonderful invitation to us as members. Brothers and sisters, whether you are carrying the burden of unresolved sin, suffering because of an offense committed against you long ago, or struggling to forgive yourself for an accidental mistake, you have access to the healing and redeeming power of the Savior Jesus Christ. He shares his own experience. He said, as he turned to the Savior, he says, my feelings of guilt and remorse were gradually replaced with peace and rest. What a beautiful promise. Then the second talk, related talk, it also kind of has mental health vibes here, is Elder Cook's talk. Now, what I thought was really interesting about Elder Cook's talk, so we we know this is the one where where he uh, gets called to speak on multiple times by President Packer, no spoilers, But it's interesting in that uh, Saturday morning session, there are two elder cooks who speak. There's first this elder cook, Elder Carl B. Cook, followed by uh, Elder Quentin L. Cook. This would have been such a great joke opportunity for the prophet to stand up and say, we will now hear from Elder Cook and then look at the wrong Elder Cook. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I missed opportunity. So let's go over his bio here. Elder Carl B. Cook, he was sustained as a general authority 70 of the church in 2011. He was named a member of the presidency of the 70 on March 31st, 2018, at the time of his call to the presidency in the 70, which I don't know how many 70s we have nowadays, how many quorums, but it it seems to be up there. 
He was serving at church headquarters. Elder Cook also served in the Africa Southeast Area Presidency. As a young man, he served in the Germany Hamburg Mission. He and Sister Cook also served as mission leaders in the New Zealand Auckland Mission. He graduated with degrees from Weber State College, Utah State University. Prior to his call to the 70, he worked in commercial real estate development. There we go. He was born in Utah in 1957, married Lynette Hansen in 1979 in the Ogden, Utah Temple. So it sounds like he spent his whole life in Ogden, and they have five children. And we're actually going to hear about his call to the 70 in his talk. So overall impressions of his talk, what'd you think? I loved the simplicity of it. I think the implications are really important for all of us, and I thought it was really relatable because of uh, of, uh, of the fact that all of us are kind of in those situations from time to time where we just feel overwhelmed and inadequate. So. Yes, I, I, I agree. He started with um, a quote from Joseph Smith. Now, Joseph Smith was a very flowery speaker. For a very simple man, his language was very flowery. And he said uh, to Elder George A. Smith, he gave this counsel to his apostle. He said, I should never get discouraged whatever difficulties might surround me. If I was sunk in the lowest pit of Nova Scotia and all the Rocky Mountains piled on top of me. So first of all, the earth would have to bend quite a bit to get those two pieces of geography to touch each other. Yeah, right. I ought not to be discouraged, but hang on, exercise faith and keep up good courage. And if I should come out and I should come out on top of the heap at last, let's put a find a point on it, but hang in there, right? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, I was thinking about this. What do, what does, what, what do we mean when we say don't be discouraged? I think that warrants some clarification, at least for me, from my point of view. Um, I like to consider myself as being responsible for the things that I am in control of and and those things that I am not in control of, I can really beat myself up over them, right? And that's and that's not fair. So how I was wondering how how discouragement fits into that, right? So a little bit further down later on in the talk he says, um discouragement um let us not feel discouragement or be overwhelmed when we face disappointment, painful experiences, our own adequacies, our own inadequacies or other challenges, right? And so that's that's the point for me that it starts to break open a little bit in terms of the definition of what discouragement is. At least that's the way that I that I chose to look at it. To feel disappointed is a natural human emotion. Of course, painful experiences are going to come our way. We're going to be faced with our own inadequacies, other challenges going to arise. These are things that are involuntary, Matthew, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we can choose to experience those or not. Those are going to happen regardless. To be discouraged ties in with the name of the talk, in my opinion. Just keep going with faith is the name of the talk. It feels to me like he's saying, and this is the takeaway for me, that to be discouraged means to give up in the face of disappointment, painful experiences, our own inadequacies, and other challenges. And so from that lens, I found that really encouraging and really insightful that, you know, to be discouraged in that sense is within my control. If my discouragement is represented by my actions, well, then they face, in the face of adversity, I can keep going. That's a way that I can express my faith. And, and maybe that's a way that we can help keep some shame out of it, where we don't have to beat ourselves up over feeling disappointed, but we can keep going. And maybe that's the point. So you're saying discouragement is a choice, whereas disappointment, the emotion, is not. You can feel disappointed without choosing to be discouraged. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the message here that uh, Elder Cook is is trying to present that in as much as discouragement is a choice, then we can choose to keep pushing forward. And he puts a very important disclaimer in the what is it fourth paragraph? Yeah, fourth paragraph. He says, "When I say discouragement, I'm not talking about the more debilitating challenges of clinical depression, anxiety disorders, or other illnesses that require special treatment. I'm just talking about plain old discouragement." that comes with the up and downs of life. And then he adds a footnote because that, that, uh, that disclaimer was not enough. He adds, when I speak of discouragement, I'm not suggesting that to just keep going with faith in Christ is the only effort needed for people experiencing clinical depression, anxiety disorders, or other illnesses. For these friends, family members, and others listening, I echo the counsel of our church leaders to please seek medical, psychological, and spiritual care while trusting in the Lord. My heart goes out to each of you wrestling with those unique challenges. We sincerely pray for you. I can only speak for those that I know, but those who I know who do have depression or anxiety or other um, illnesses that, that cause them grief, they sometimes hear these messages of general conference that speak of lofty ideals, and then they measure themselves against the ideal. And instead of being an opportunity to feel 
hopeful and inspired to go and walk a few feet more, it just feels like this overwhelming condemnation. They feel like they're failing conference. And I, I feel like Elder Cook's really pressing on that pedal right here and saying this is not at all what we are talking about here. You need to learn to separate out what, you, like you said, what you can and cannot control. And I feel that's a hammer that keeps getting repeatedly hit every conference in the past several years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's no uh, it's no doubt that mental health issues are on the rise, right? Um, we we're living in an increasingly complex society with competition and comparison rampant everywhere, and and these are just a few of the factors that I think are affecting how hard it is to to find peace within ourselves and, and mental health is a very real concern. And so I appreciated that he put that in there. For somebody who has mental illness, I think disappointment and painful experiences are accentuated. I think the I think the experiences and the and the emotions of somebody who's struggling acutely with some sort of mental distress are intense and and very hard to deal with. And so when we're talking like you said about discouragement or when general conference comes up with lofty ideals and expectations, because let's be honest, within the church, there are very high expectations. It's mm. hard not to get discouraged. And yet, you know, as important as mental health counseling is, which I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of, um, there still needs to be the choice to say, I am going to stand up and I am going to move forward and I'm going to be humble and I'm going to act with faith and I'm going to do everything that I can to live the life that I want to live. And that that includes, I think, seeking the right services and the right help. Um, but you know, just just because we have a mental illness doesn't mean there's nothing we can do, right? It, it may it may be very painful, it may be very hard, but that doesn't devoid us of any responsibility. And this is something I've seen come up as a, a danger with family and friends. As sometimes when we seek mental health help, we do it in a way that almost negates the principle of agency every problem becomes an out there problem. And every issue that we face, every shortcoming that we have becomes a problem with society, with our family, with our friends, with everybody else. And, and of course, as imperfect beings, there's truth in all that. But we also must remember that we are under responsibility to control what we can control. And, and that's where agency comes in. And how we respond to it, that's where courage versus discouragement comes in. And, and I think that's what Elder Cook is really trying to hit on here. What's interesting is he's about to share opportunities where he could have taken a lot of discouragement. And his trial was another general authority, which I've never heard a conference story quite like that before. Let me tell you about this trial I had with elder so-and-so. Yeah, yeah that's pretty rich. I like that too. Yeah, no. So I, I was thinking as, as, I was, as I was listening to this talk again, you know, what are some of the reasons why it's hard for us, whether we have a mental health concern or not, to just keep going with faith? And you know, for the sake of time, there there were a number of things that I that I thought of. But one of the more interesting ones that that came to mind is authenticity, uh, Matthew. And I and I wonder if you've if you've experienced this or heard of this yourself. But imposter syndrome is a really real thing for a lot of us. I'm a software engineer. Everyone's got imposter syndrome here. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, there's. I think that's very relatable, and it feels to me like that's kind of what he's what he's describing to some extent. His experience standing up at that first stake. Um, state council or a state conference meeting that he was presiding at, right? He, to some degree, all of us are going to feel like we don't belong, like we're a fake. And that's an important barrier that I think it's important for all of us to be cognizant of as we're trying to just press forward and she's just keep going with faith. There are going to be moments when we feel inauthentic, when we wonder, what am I even doing here? And, you know, I was thinking about that. Um, I don't know that there's any other way, Matthew for us to learn than just putting ourselves out there. There are plenty of opportunities, I think, to sit back and to, and to learn and to, you know, you could go to college to become a software engineer and, and, and so forth. But at some point, you got to put yourself out there. At some point, you've got to expose yourself to the reality of, of the difficult task in front of you and, and use that as your opportunity to learn. I think that we discover what we are, what we really are made of in the process of doing what we thought was too hard. That's kind of how we learn English. I think that's kind of how we learn anything. So that's my counter to the inauthentic argument. We can all feel inauthentic when we're doing that, but maybe that's how we actually discover who we are in the process of facing things that we thought were too hard. I love that quote. You discover who you are in the process of facing something you thought was impossible. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, was it President Kimball who said, a testimony is to be found in the bearing of it? 
It's that walking a few steps past the light that you find out where the path keeps going. When you talk about being inauthentic, another word that I hear is inadequate. And boy, don't we all struggle with that. And the, the quote comes to my mind from President Eyring in his, uh, his wonderful talk, Rise to Your Call, back in 2002. He, uh, speaking to everyone given any sort of church calling, he makes a lot of prof- promises that are really powerful. And this one really stuck out to me as being almost funny. He said, there will be times when you will feel overwhelmed. One of the ways you will be attacked is with the feeling that you are inadequate. Well, you are inadequate pause. <laughs> it's where you're like, that is not what I expect him to say. I expect him to say, well, you know, through the Savior, you can do all things and you're ca- more capable than you know of. He says, no, you are inadequate. You are inadequate to answer a call to represent God with only your own powers, but you have access to more than your natural capacities and you do not work alone. The Lord will magnify what you say and what you do in the eyes of the people you serve. The day of your release will teach you a great lesson. Um, I, I think often back on that whenever I face something that's impossible. It's one thing to say we believe that Jesus is there for other people. It's another thing to actually put that on the line and say, I'm going to go out and do something I have no business doing. <laughs> and Jesus take the wheel in a sense. Yeah, no, sure. Um, well, when when you talk about inadequacy, Matthew, and one thing that comes to mind with, with the people that I, that I have the wonderful opportunity of working with is that it feels like we want certainty, you know? to to feel like we are adequate, to be certain about our own adequacy would be really nice. I think that's a natural and normal human desire is to feel like we're standing on solid ground. I want to be certain that everything is okay. While that is a normal human experience for us to crave, I don't know that that was ever the point in the plan of salvation. So I like that you mentioned that, that that's kind of a rich a rich moment in the, in the talk when he just pauses there and lets us kind of feel the gravity of that for a second. Yeah, you're inadequate, right? And that's good. As far as I can tell, you know, the war in heaven um, was all about certainty. There was a a third of the host of heaven that was saying, you know, I just want to make sure that I can return home. No questions asked. Everything is taken care of. Free pass. Matthew, it was that craving for certainty and that dependence on certainty that got them expelled from the presence of God. Whereas the rest of us being willing to say, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I don't know if I'm going to be good enough, but I trust that I'll be able to find my way home. I trust the Savior that he'll be able to redeem me. It was that trust that allowed us to come to this earth and to be able to gain the experiences that we're having. And so I find it tragic when myself, when others that I work with, get stuck in this same dilemma again of inadequacy, of saying, I have to prove it. I have to find the certainty again. And it's difficult to sit in that uncertainty and to say, I don't know if my efforts are good enough. But if you look around and if you look at the congregation, if you look at people in your life who are members of the church, I think you're going to find, sadly, that this is pretty common. All of us are trying to make efforts to prove that we're okay and to be certain that we're okay. Whereas, it, and this is maybe kind of harsh on my end, but it takes a lot of faith to be able to say, you know what, maybe I'm not okay and maybe I'm inadequate and maybe that's the point and maybe that's okay and maybe I can do my best and maybe Christ will save me. And that doesn't mean that we can just go out and sin, right? We we got to do our best and we have to it means we put it all on the line. Right. But that's that's kind of an all-in mentality, and I, I, I really appreciate that, for one. Well, Elder Cook certainly had that all-in mentality. Um, I, I've heard people say that President Packer doesn't necessarily come off in the greatest light uh, in these stories. I would say <laughs> that he, he comes off the way that Jesus does many times in the New Testament. And if you want to say that's not the greatest light, oh, well, that's on you. He starts out by, again, as you point out, this is a first state conference. As he's sitting on the stand, he leans over to the stake president and he whispers, this is a wonderful stake. President Packer elbowed me gently and said, no talking. He says, I stopped talking. Hey, that was really good. <laughs> it's the same voice as, the, uh, as one of the characters on The Mandalorian. I have spoken. Yeah, it's, the same. He's, it's basically the same guy. I'm not going to be able to unsee that now. And, and when President Packer speaks, he does speak with that finality of I have spoken. So when he said that, I resonated with that because I have a traumatic moment from my childhood when we we're in, this must have been like fifth grade or something. And I was the kind of kid that never flipped my light to yellow, let alone to red or double red. But the teacher was at her wits end with people chatting. Someone leaned over and asked me a question and I got in trouble for it. Matthew, no talking. And I was ready to cry, man. I was ready to cry. So I was like, 
no, this is happening to him now. Except this time, instead of a sixth grade teacher, it's a, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. I might have taken offense at that. I might have said, wow, that just lowered my estimation of an apostle down a few notches that he would think I'm chit-chatting, something like that. But I love how he responded. He said, I stopped talking and his general conference talk, Reverence Invites Revelation, came to mind. I observed that President Packer was writing down scripture references, so he's attentive. Instead of taking offense, he pays attention to what President Packer's doing. The Spirit confirmed to me that he was receiving impressions for the meeting. My learning experience had just begun. When I think about how he chose not to take offense, and even in this initial interaction, I think of a quote from Elder Christofferson's talk from April 2011 called, As Many As I Love, I Rebuke and Chasing. It's a wonderful talk. If y'all haven't read it yet, go revisit it. He talks about accepting criticism, expecting correction, even seeking correction, which is very counterintuitive to our natural man, right? And you may say, okay, well, that's all nice when someone that I know and trust is lovingly telling me how to get closer to the Savior. But what about when people are just attacking me or making a, a personal attack based on my beliefs or something? He gives this wonderful counsel that I've tried to apply in my life with varying degrees of success at certain times, but I certainly think is, is super helpful. He says, even when we encounter mean-spirited criticism from persons who have little regard or love for us, it can be helpful to exercise enough meekness to weigh it and sift out anything that might benefit us. From, benefit us. So even when we're facing a bad situation of just attacks, he says, you know what? Instead of taking offense, see if you can glean anything good out of even something bad like that. What an optimistic view. Those are the hardest moments to, uh, to glean something good. And it's our, it's our defenses, you know, our pride that are very natural. Those are very natural man experiences that get in the way and prevent us from doing that to, to be humble enough to be able to say, I'm going to take some of the good out of this experience is not easy to do in my opinion. And so I always admire people that are able to do that. There's a lot of places under that, uh, under that structure that we could gain a lot of knowledge about ourselves. The, the kind of, the kind of resources that we could tap into to help us understand ourselves better are limitless according to that definition, if we're humble enough to access them. That's certainly something that I need to work on. The part of uh, his talk that that impressed me as far as the just keep going with faith is concerned from his end, Matthew, was the fact that he kept getting up. To stand in front of a congregation and speak without having anything prepared is a pretty daunting experience, I would imagine. I don't know completely. I've never had that exact experience. And the scripture comes to mind of, you know, I will you treasure up the word and, and it will be given to you in that hour, every portion that is meted to, to every man. And it takes a lot of trust. Um, I think from a psychological perspective, that makes a lot of sense, but it's still hard to trust because, you know, if, if we're spending time treasuring up the word and we're thinking and we're trying to gather information and make connections and do our studying, then that knowledge is there. But in the heat of the moment where our fight or flight is activated and we feel our defenses are up and we're scared and we're nervous. Social anxiety is an extremely normal thing. It's hard to access and to think clearly. And so to trust that you're in good hands and wait for something to come to mind, it's not an easy thing to do. So I like that he got the chance to practice that and that what he, what he suggests I think is really good advice. Just keep going with faith. Something will come to mind. The spirit will be there. You've got to trust me. And I don't remember exactly what his experience was. I don't remember the end of the, of the talk, but that happened to him, didn't it not? Yeah, he ended up speaking seven times over the course of like 12 hours. So <laughs> he spoke three times. So even the first time he just said, speak what you feel and press. And he shared for 14 minutes. And then President Packer got up and shared another 10 minutes. And he says, we will now hear from Elder Cook again. <laughs> up he comes and three times during the leadership session, followed by another three times in the adult session that night. And mercifully, just once, in the general session of state conference, but that is seven times in one state conference that you've got to speak. People have such a fear of public speaking that statistically, if they're asked to speak at a funeral, they'd rather be in the coffin. <laughs> I do a podcast. Hopefully I'm okay at speaking off the cuff, but like that seven times, I, I don't know. And he talks about how exhausted and shocked he was and how he just wanted to run away, but he chose not to. To just keep going with faith. Um, his example here of standing up and seven times, as you described, continuing to say, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I am just going to keep going, has some powerful implications for all of our lives. 
I think, Matthew. And I'm really fond of that idea. How beautiful is it that there are so many times in our lives where we literally don't know what we are supposed to do next? Okay, we might feel that as a, as a father or a mother. We might feel that in a relationship with somebody who's struggling with a problem we've never encountered before. Certainly, we all experience that in our, in our daily labors, in our professions, and the things that we're trying to do. If we just stop and say, I don't know how to do this, therefore I must pause and wait for it to get better, I don't know that we'll ever get there. That's a harrowing moment. That's such an important moment of growth where we take that leap of faith and we say, it's going to be all right. I remember one experience I had with my dad. We were actually doing some rock climbing and, and to practice our, out our ropes and, and to see how all the equipment was working. We went out um, to the to the Poudre River in Colorado when we were living there. And I and we threw a rope over a tree and I had the harness on and I climbed up the side of this tree. I had really big, thick crevices in the bark. So it was almost like a rock face in some ways. Climbed up that really energetically um, and then got stuck, right? I was holding on to one of the first branches, which was pretty up high, maybe like 25 feet. And I was holding on. I was losing my grip strength and I couldn't hold on any longer. And my dad said, just let go. From my vantage point, it looked like if I did, I would swing straight into and be impaled by another opposing branch. And I was freaking out about that. And he said, no, I can see it. It's going to be okay. I can see where you're going to land. As soon as you let go, I'm going to I'm gonna let you have some slack. You're going to drop down. You're going to miss everything. You're going to be fine. Well, I didn't really have a choice because I was, I, was I was slipping either way. But I'm proud of myself that in the last moment, I said, you know what? Okay, I trust my dad. I let go. I swung, missed the branch by maybe three or four feet and, and landed back down safely. And I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I just had to trust that it was going to work out. And, and for me, that's always been a powerful lesson. That, that, and this talk reminded me of that. I think we're talking about the same thing here where our Father in Heaven sees so much more than we do, and He asks us to stand up and to speak and to get involved and to do things when we feel unprepared and we feel like it's scary. We, we can even feel like it's going to hurt us, our reputations. Those are the moments when it's the hardest to trust, I think, right? If you're perfectly calm, then you can access your uh, reservoirs of knowledge inside of your mind, inside of your body, and you can say, yeah, I've got this covered. But that's hard to access in that moment when that sympathetic nervous system is activated and lighting up like a Christmas tree. So, yeah. But we do it anyway, and then he provides a way, and it all makes sense. To overcome the natural man and go forth like Nephi, not knowing beforehand the things he should do. Right. So after his, his seven extemporaneous talks, President Packer said with affection, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> he said, I love President Boyd K. Packer and appreciate all that I learned. I love his take on this. I, again, I would have been a little salty afterwards, but he's not. He says, do you know what I am grateful for? That I didn't give up or resist. If I had given in to my desperate desire to escape from those meetings, I would have missed an opportunity to increase my faith and receive a rich outpouring of love and support from my Heavenly Father. I learned of His mercy the miraculous enabling power of Jesus Christ and his atonement. This is something we didn't talk about. We talked about in the previous talk, the scope of the atonement is so much larger than we often give it credit for. Elder Bednar loves to hit on this point, the enabling power of the atonement. The atonement's not just to patch the holes. It's not just to cover the problems. It's to build us up and raise us to something grander and stronger than we ever were before. He says, in spite of my weakness, I learned that I can serve. I can contribute when the Lord is by my side if I just keep going with faith. And maybe that's a common thread tying these two talks together, Matthew. Elder Muir's talk and Elder Cook's talk, both talking about finding grace that is bigger than ourselves when we take that step forward. And in, in one case, it was about forgiving oneself. And in another case, it was about acting with faith when, you know, when trials and and difficulties arose. But at the end of the day, I think those two talks are saying something similar about the role of Christ in our lives when it comes to things that we feel inadequate to solve. Yep. So invitation to you listeners, get out there, overcome the natural man, help Christ fill the holes that you have and raise you up and make you stronger. Thanks for listening, everyone, to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discuss Elder Carl B. Cooks and Elder Peter F., uh, however you pronounce it, Muirs, 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 addresses on Keep Going With Faith and, and He Could Heal Me. 
If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere you get your podcasts. You can find links to all our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org, where you can also follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, find the resources we mentioned in this episode, and learn more about us, your hosts. If you want to follow me, Matthew Watkins, you can follow me at powerinthebook.com or on Twitter at Joyful Repenter. Big thanks to my good friend and podcast guest, Eric Wells, for joining us today and sharing his really awesome insights on this. But of course, while we always appreciate new followers, it's better to follow the prophet and apostles themselves. Remember, although we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions. For the which, we invite you to tune in next week on the Conference Talk Podcast. Podcast.